morning, everyone. How many of you guys had your first day of school today? You guys seem super pumped. Let's go. School. Woo. Yeah, said nobody ever. Um, well, thank you for joining us on your first day of school. That's impressive. We're glad that you're here. Um, I don't know if you guys know this. First of all, uh, if it's your first time here, my name's Justin. Hi. Welcome. Glad you're here. Um, we are a family of imperfect people who are trying to love Jesus, journey together, and bring hope to our world. That's who we are here at Woods Edge Student Ministry. Um, I'm the lead student pastor, um, and so if I've never met you before, come up, introduce yourself. I want to get to know you, meet you. Um, I'm excited to jump into our message today because I did not preach all summer. So it has been, I don't think I have preached since May. That is a long, long time. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I'm excited to get in this fall. I'm excited to get back into the rhythm of preaching. Um, next week, in case you were wondering, we kick off community groups. So it's going to be amazing. Um, if you do not have a church home, you're here for the first time, you're here with a friend, we would love for you to come back next Wednesday, get plugged in to a community group. Um, our Wednesday night services are our main services uh, because we have worship and a message and we get to dialogue and process through scripture in community every single Wednesday. And so this is, this is where we put the most of our energy in what we do in student ministry. So I encourage you guys, encourage your friends, come on a Wednesday night. Uh, but if you uh, are new and you also want to come on Sunday, we have Sunday services 9 and 11. Uh, they are still done with excellence. Uh, we just don't have small groups. So uh, come to next week, get signed up for community groups. Uh, also, we have an event coming up September 16th called the Tournament of Champions. <laughs> And this is an amazing event uh, where there's tournaments and you can be a champion. Was that a good enough promo? Um, honestly, sign up for Tournament of Champions. It's going to be so much fun. Even if you're like, I don't want to participate in a tournament, that's okay. You can just register, come hang out. It will be a lot, a lot of fun. Um, last year, uh, shh. Uh, last year was our very first tournament champions. Were any of you guys there? Did any of you guys go? So it was, if you weren't there, it was absolutely amazing. It was the very first time we had ever thrown the event. And so tournament champions is like, it's a bunch of mini tournaments all happening at the same time. And there's fun stuff happening in here in the auditorium. There's food, there's all kinds of stuff. It, it was so much fun. And honestly, when you're preparing for an event, it's always hard, especially if you've never done it before. Cause we like dream up these things and we're like, what if we did this event? We're like, we have tournaments and everybody can come. They'll sign up. And the truth is, you're like, I don't know if anyone's actually going to show up to this. Like, we might promote it and have, like, one team sign up. And so it went really, really, really well. Like, we expected maybe, like, 60 people, 80 people max. And there was, like, almost 200 people that came to the event. It was unbelievable. And so I'm, like, riding this crazy high of like, yes, God is on the move. I'm excited. We're in the fall. Things are moving. Like I was, I was really on the top of the world. And the following week, something crazy happened. Uh, my son, Hudson, he was four years old at the time. He got uh, just kind of what we thought was just a head cold. So he got some congestion, but that happened. We started to notice he was congested kind of in the morning. And already by the evening, he was kind of like already sounding weird while he was breathing. And so we didn't really think much of it. We we're like, hey, he'll get a good night's sleep. We'll check in in the morning. Well, the next day he was super lethargic. His breathing was even worse. And so Chelsea took him to the pediatrician. And so Chelsea walks into the pediatrician's office. They check in. They head in to go to the back. The nurse starts taking vitals. And as she is taking vitals of Hudson, she drops everything that she is doing and she sprints down the hallway. And Chelsea's like, what is going on? 
And so she grabs the doctor and she comes back and they start to tell Chelsea that Hudson's oxygen levels are not doing well. Most people are usually sitting at about 98%, 99% O2 levels, oxygen levels. If you go below 90%, you can actually start to have organ damage and organ failure. So it's a really serious deal to keep your oxygen levels in a healthy range. And she checked his oxygen and Hudson was at 88%. And so she rushed to the doctor. They started doing some breathing treatments. They start working on him. And miraculously, Hudson starts to do better. So his stats jump up to 93%. He gets to go home uh, and we get some medicine and we're just kind of monitoring him that night. Well, that night we put him to bed and Chelsea goes to check on him a couple hours later and she checks, uh, she checks his oxygen and he's at 85%. And so she's like, and they had basically told us like, if, if it drops below 90 again, you need to rush him to the emergency room. So Chelsea rushes Hudson to the emergency room. Remember, I'm coming off this amazing event where I'm like, yeah, God, you're so good. I can't believe like, I'm on the top of the world. Life is awesome. And then this is all going on. My world is just thrown into chaos. So Chelsea rushes to the emergency room. She gets there, she checks in at the front desk and she tells them everything that's happened. Like, hey, he's in a scary oxygen level. And she's like, yeah, 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 okay, thanks. Find a seat, like uh, emergency rooms, am I, am I right? Um, so Chelsea's sitting there and they end up calling her back to like this waiting room. So they call her back to this room where they basically do like a preliminary check on, your, on how you're doing so that they can triage you accordingly. Like they basically put you in whoever's in worse shape. They need to go to the top of the line to see the doctors first. So she goes to that office and she starts to explain the story to this nurse. And the nurse is kind of like, yeah, okay, thanks. Awesome. Well, the nurse checks Hudson's O2 level on his finger and is like, kind of acting like something's off. So she checks the next finger and then she's like, you know, maybe we'll try your toe. So she takes off, she tries his toe she and she's, thanks Siri. Fingers in Wikipedia. Fabulous. Awesome. <laughs> Knowledge is power. Um, my, no, I'm totally, I, I have ADHD. That happened. I'm like, never, I, let's recover. Okay. Where was I at? They checked his toe. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Okay, so they, they check his toe and this, this nurse has the same response. She like stands up and she like starts throwing like gang signs to all these other like nurses and doctors. She's like, she's like Navy SEAL symbols. And you're like, I don't know what's happening. And then she like opens up this secret portal that Chelsea's like, I didn't even know there was a door there in this room. Like the whole wall opens up and she like goes into this like emergency room area. And when this nurse like throws these gang signs at the other doctors, like all of these people stand up and like rush into this room, like seven or eight doctors, nurses, everybody packed in this room. And so Chelsea, they're like, tell Chelsea to go in there. Chelsea walks in there. No one says a word to her. They just take Hudson, put him on the table and start hooking everything up to him. And so Chelsea is like, what is going on? What in the world is happening? I'm scared to death. I'm at home. So I'm like getting texts and calls randomly and like getting bits and pieces of information. I'm scared to death. Nothing the doctors is doing is working. They're giving him breathing treatments. They're, they're giving him steroids. They're doing all these things. And his breathing is getting worse, not better. And we are just like, what, what is happening? They're saying like, hey, we need to get this under control or he could head to organ failure. And we're praying, we're crying out to the Lord and things are not getting better. Chelsea and I were stuck. We had no idea what to do. And there was no way for us to help, no way for us to fight, no way for us to change the situation. We were just stuck feeling helpless and hopeless. And the truth is, we've all had moments like that. Maybe not to that level or that gravity, but we've all had moments where life seems to be going really well and then something happens and it just, you just feel like you just can't go on. Have you been there? We've all had those moments. When life just gets so full of chaos, we just, we just want to give up. 
And honestly, what's strange is it doesn't matter how many wins we've had. It doesn't matter how good things were before. It doesn't matter how many victories we've had in the past. Those moments happen and we find ourselves as human beings feeling hopeless and helpless all over again. And so today we're going to dive into 1 Kings chapter 19 and we're going to learn some practical principles for finding freedom as we navigate seasons of chaos. So if you have your Bibles, you got your Bible app, open up to 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, If you do not have your Bible, verses are going to be on the screen. But it is important that we open up our Bibles and learn how to navigate the Word of God. Uh, If you guys would, stand on up with me. We stand in honor of the Word of God. We don't believe that the Bible is a work of fiction or a bunch of fairy tales or a bunch of good moral teachings. We literally believe it is the words of God, that God speaks to us through the Bible. And so we stand to honor the fact that God is speaking to us right now. And so let's jump into this together, starting in verse 1. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. I'll come back to that and talk about what Elijah did, which is pretty amazing. Uh, But we'll get to that, okay? Patience, patience, okay? So he tells Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who've already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baking on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that as we open up your word that you would speak to us. God, uh, speak through me that, Lord, you would help every word to be clear, that, God, nothing would be miscommunicated from your word, but that, Lord, you would protect your sacred word and that, Lord, you would speak to us tonight and that it would transform us. Lord, we believe you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. Okay. So we start off saying that Ahab, he's the king at the time. King Ahab goes home and tells the queen Jezebel that Elijah had done all of these things, including killing the prophets of Baal. So if we go back to 1 Kings 17 and 18, here's what Elijah had been up to. No big deal, okay? Uh, Elijah prophesies, so he hears from the Lord that there's going to be a drought. So he tells the king, hey, there's going to be a drought. There's not going to be any rain. And it actually happens. And while everyone else is like struggling through this drought, Elijah is being fed by ravens, like, like birds, just like flying up and like feeding him. Okay, that's pretty awesome. Like, okay, there's a drought. No one has food, but I just get my food from birds. Don't even have to worry about it. Sounds pretty cool. Then, at the end of chapter 17, we see that Elijah goes to help this lady with her sick kid, but the kid dies, and so Elijah literally raises this kid from the dead. So in one chapter, we've got prophesies about drought and it actually happens, uh, being fed by random birds, uh, and raising a kid from the dead. Awesome. Great chapter. Moving on to chapter 18, there's all these false prophets of Baal. And Elijah goes toe-to-toe to to them. He's like, let's figure out whose God is real, my God or Baal. He says, let's set up altars and we will both pray to our gods. And whichever God sends down fire and burns up the offering on the altar, that is the one true God. And they're like, awesome. There's 400 prophets for Baal, just Elijah for God. They go toe-to-toe. They're like praying to their God. And Elijah's like, huh, maybe he's in the bathroom. Like, maybe that's why he's not answering. Like, maybe he's just a little busy. He never answers. 
Elijah prays that God would send down fire. God answers and burns up the offering, the wood, the stones, the water, everything on this altar that there could have been burns up. And Elijah ends up like slaughtering all of these prophets of Baal that are against the Lord. Crazy, okay? That's what it talks about in that first verse. And then after that happens, Elijah is like, you know what? I think it's time to end this drought. So he prays and the drought ends. Insane spiritual resume, right? Can we all agree? Elijah had accomplished some amazing victories by trusting the Lord. He literally defeats the prophets of Baal and then just like prays and like all of a sudden it starts raining after it hasn't rained for months. But Jezebel puts a hit out on him and he runs straight to the wilderness and he's asking the Lord to end his life. Have you ever experienced highs and lows like that? It sounds dramatic, but I think the truth is, yes, we all have. Even if we can be honest and be like, my situation wasn't as bad as Elijah's, it still felt that way in the moment, right? We're on top of the world and we just feel like we just can't go on anymore out of nowhere. One second, you're on the top of the world. You just won the championship. You're finally dating that girl that you have liked for so long. You're worried, yeah, right? Let's go, J-Fan. Speak it into existence, bro. You're working at a job that you love. You just got into your dream college. Like, life is going so well. And then the next thing you know, you don't make the team the following year or your boyfriend breaks up with you and starts talking crap behind your back or you're fired from your job or you struggle in every class that you have. Shh. Here's the deal. Elijah had experienced amazing moves of God, but right now he's in an all-time low. He doesn't want to go on. It doesn't matter how good things were in the past. His current circumstances are so overwhelming, he's like, I just don't even want to go on. Have you been there? Here's the thing. Elijah had an enemy, right? Elijah had a physical enemy. He had Jezebel who was after him, yes. But he also had Satan as his enemy who had placed Jezebel to try and get rid of this man of God. And we face the same enemy today. And he hates to see you happy and fulfilled. So we should never be surprised when we're experiencing really great victory in our lives and we're seeing the Lord move and we're seeing the Lord transform us and work in us and then we start to almost immediately face opposition, right? Like you start to read your Bible every single day and then all of a sudden, it's harder than it's ever been to just stay focused. Or you go to Freedom Weekend or summer camp and you have this amazing experience and you're like, man, God, thank you for this freedom. Thank you for, for uh, working in my life. I just can't wait to continue to invest in this relationship. And, and then two weeks after camp, like you're right back where you started. Because we have an enemy who does not want to see us fulfilled. He does not want to see us happy. He doesn't want to see you at peace. He wants you to feel like your life is falling apart and like everything is chaos. But here's the deal. Even though we have an enemy that doesn't want to see us succeed, it's important to remember that he is no match for our God. He is no match for our God. If you are a child of God, if you are a Christian, you have surrendered lordship to God Almighty and believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again to save you from your sin and forgive you. If you believe that, nothing Satan can throw at you has any power over your life. Amen? Amen. Point number one, as we dig deeper into this passage, don't over-spiritualize or emotionalize your pain. Let's start in verse five. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. So Elijah's sleeping, and as he's sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. 
He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. So this angel shows up and puts Elijah through the best recovery routine that this holy angel can think of. Healthy nutritional diet and nice good night's sleep. <laughs> That's literally like an angel from the Lord shows up and he doesn't do anything miraculous. He doesn't tell Elijah to do some crazy faithful thing. He's like, hey bud, just, just take a nap. <laughs> just take a nap. Eat some good food. Like get rejuvenated. I think sometimes we can way over spiritualize and emotionalize the things that we are walking through. We can lose perspective and here's the thing. The Lord has given us our brains to be able to think logically. Like that's why he gave us brains. He's put the Holy Spirit inside of us to guide that logic. Like if you are a son of God, a daughter of God, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you guiding that logic and he has given us the Bible to double check that our logic lines up with the spirit of truth. We don't need to over-spiritualize so many things. Sometimes the world is not crashing down around you. You just need to go to sleep, put your phone down, eat some great bluebell ice cream, and then just call it a day. Here's the deal. Some of you have been blaming Satan for way too many of your problems. You've been blaming Satan for way too many of your problems. And here's the deal. I'm not saying that Satan is not a real threat. I, I, I prefaced all of this with saying that Satan is a real threat. He still is no match to our God, but he is a real threat. So I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that sometimes... There are easy, logical solutions to some of our problems, but we don't find victory because we over-spiritualize or over-emotionalize our issues. We're spending way too much time seeking the Lord and we're, we're praying and we're like, God, I just need your help. I just don't know why I struggle with this. God, I need you to intervene. God, I don't know why this is happening. And the truth is, like, here's some examples for you. You want some real life examples? Sadly, I have said pretty much all of these, okay? So I'm like chief sinner over here as I throw these stones. So just so we can all be on the same page, okay? Example number one, Satan's just really testing my patience lately. When the truth is, you need to work on your time management. You're running late to literally everything and you wonder why you don't have patience. Like that's an easy, logical step. Don't, don't over-spiritualize it. My ADHD just makes it so hard for me to focus. I am, that is right here, okay? But here's the deal. The truth is, uh, maybe you haven't done your homework in weeks. You haven't practiced any of the material that you're learning, and you're not struggling in school because your ADHD just makes you not concentrate. You're just, you're not putting in the work. Maybe you're like, oh man, my anxiety is so overwhelming in this season but you haven't put down your phone and gone to bed at a reasonable time in weeks. You haven't exercised in months. Let's not, let's not over-spiritualize and over-emotionalize our problems, right? Like sometimes there are very logical and like real tangible things that we can do to get healthy. I struggle with anxiety. I know if, I, if my schedule is all over the place, and I'm not exercising regularly, it's gonna be a lot worse. Can I pray to the Lord? Yes. Will he listen to my prayer? Yes. Will he care? Yes. Will he probably move on my behalf? Yes. But I also can just go, I can probably just start exercising 30 minutes a day and I'm gonna be a healthier person. I'm gonna be a better husband and a better dad and I'm gonna not struggle with my anxiety. And it's a practical thing to do. Let's not over-spiritualize and over-emotionalize things. Number two. Be honest about your feelings. So 
counteracting. Like uh, if any of you guys are like, oh, I don't like, I don't like this over, like my emotions are healthy. Yes. Okay. You just had to wait till point number two. Okay. Your emotions are good. What we feel is valid and we need to be honest about our feelings, especially with the Lord. Look at verse uh, number nine. There, Elijah came to a cave where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Elijah does not hold back. God's like, uh, hey, Elijah, what are you doing here? He's like, let me tell you, God. Right? Like, whoa. He's like, oh, what, you, what am I doing here? Are you kidding me? Have you not seen what's going on right now, God? I am running for my life because I did what you told me to do. And Elijah is very honest about it. We need to be able to be honest about our feelings. Here are some facts about feelings. If you're not taking notes already, please write these things down. Facts about feelings. Fact number one, feelings are not reality. Have you ever thought that someone was mad at you to only talk to them later and find out they were really never mad at you at all? You felt a certain way and it was not reality. Our feelings are not reality. Fact number two, Feelings are neutral. Feelings are not positive or negative, good or bad. They are neutral. It may seem like joy is more advantageous than sadness. Like how many of you guys are like, yeah, I'd rather be joyful than sad. Yes and amen, okay? So it can seem like joy is more advantageous than sadness. However, joy, get this, joy means I get something I care about. Sadness means I lose something I care about. But the feelings are neutral. They're not positive or negative, good or bad. Therefore, leading into fact number three, feelings can help us identify our true values. If you want to know who you really are deep down inside, start to process and evaluate your feelings. Think about it this way. Uh, if I feel joy when I pet my dog Willow and sadness when Willow is not with me on vacation, then both of those emotions are trying to show me that I value Willow's presence, right? The feelings are neutral. They don't have any positive or negative, good or bad attached to them. They are showing me what is valuable and then I can make a logical decision based on my feelings because I've taken the time to process them. That is why it is not even recommended. It is essential that we are honest about our feelings with the Lord. Elijah gets it so well. God's like, hey, Elijah, what are you doing? He's like, let me tell you. I'm just waiting for you to ask. <laughs> Our feelings are valuable and useful when understood correctly. A huge part of growing and being healthy is being honest with God about how we're feeling and allowing God to help us process our emotions through a biblical lens. Point number three, trust God has a plan. So we don't want to over-spiritualize or emotionalize our pain when we're in the middle of chaos. But while we're in the middle of that chaos, we want to be honest about our feelings with the Lord and with the people walking alongside us. And we want to trust that God has a plan. Verse 11. This is the Lord speaking. Go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. 
After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire was the sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Does this Bible story remind you guys of anything? See, the original readers would have started drawing lots of parallels to the story of Moses when he receives the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. You see, Elijah is by himself on Mount Sinai at the moment. He sees... uh, these amazing things. He sees wind that's like so powerful, it's breaking apart mountains, and there's an earthquake, and then there's these fires. Well, when Moses is up on the mountain with God getting the Ten Commandments, there's like this huge clouds and like thunderstorms around the whole time. But what's interesting is in Moses' situation, God, like the symbols of fire and wind and these, this, these clouds, that was actually symbolizing God's presence. So Elijah, at this point, would have actually been looking mostly for the Lord in the wind that was powerful enough to break the mountain. So this is a guy just trying to save his life. He's interacting with the Lord. God's like, what are you doing here? He's super mad at God. He's like, you know what I'm doing here. I'm running for my life. You're supposed to be protecting me. I'm following you. I'm your prophet. No one even loves you anymore. I'm the only one left who worships you. Like he's letting loose. And God doesn't show up in these big, huge ways and all of these chaotic things that's not how he shows up this time while Elijah is in this place in this season feeling like he doesn't want to go on God shows up and speaks in with a gentle whisper and Elijah follows that whisper to the front of the cave He's using his jacket. It's super windy. Things are still chaotic. He's using his jacket to block himself from the wind. He goes to the very front of the cave. And the whisper just says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah, totally missing the point, just says exactly what he said the first time. And I'm sure God's like, aha, come on, Elijah. Gave you a second chance, nothing. But here's the deal. Even though Elijah doesn't get it, God is gentle and patient. And in that gentle whisper, this is what God says. Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of abel Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu. And those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. It's like God knows Elijah is having the worst day of all time. So he gives him a good meal. He makes sure he gets a good night's sleep. And then in the middle of the chaos, he forces Elijah to come near. Right? Like how many times does our pain drive us closer to the Lord and he allows it because he knows it's going to drive us into his arms. And so the Lord forces Elijah into this posture. And then he, it's almost like God just kind of leans down and just speaks this to him. He's like, Elijah, I've got this. Like, I've so got this that you can actually just go back to town 
on the same path that you came here on. Like the same path that people would be following you on to try and find you and kill you because that's what Jezebel is doing. Yeah, I've got a plan that's so good, you can just walk right back to town. And just in case you're a little scared, hey, guess what? This guy Hazael, he's gonna kill the people that you might not have taken care of. And then the people that he doesn't take care of, Jehu will. And the people that he doesn't, Elisha will. And then, hey, on top of that, I know you're feeling really alone right now. I, I know you feel like you don't have anyone who's in this fight with you, anyone who shares the same values, anyone who's running the same direction and trying to pursue me the way that you are. And so just for good measure, Elijah, I'm gonna show you and assure you, there's not just gonna be you, but there's gonna be 7,000 people who are willing to listen to me and walk with me and love me. That is the God that we serve. It seems like when the world is falling apart, God assures Elijah he has a plan and he's in control and that Elijah can really trust him. You know, when we were in the hospital with Hudson, we felt super, super helpless. Uh, do we have pictures of Hudson? I don't know if I asked you to throw those up earlier. So this was, this was him in the hospital. So this is, when it, this is a little early on. This is kind of the progression. You can click through them slowly, Joshua. The progression of him, like, in the hospital. So we are struggling. Right? Like we felt helpless. We had no control of the situation. And it seemed like everything the doctors are trying is not working. The next morning comes and there's still no improvement. Things are getting worse quickly. And to be very honest, I'm losing hope. Like I'm, I'm praying stuff like, God, please do not take my son from me. And we're trying really hard to be like, God, we know you're good. God, we know you've got a plan. God, we know that we should trust you. But in the middle of it, as we're in the middle of this chaos, that's really hard. We felt hopeless. We felt helpless. But I remember as people were praying for us and as we would sit down and pray, like fervently pray for Hudson and just pray for our situation, I would have these weird, like, almost like concerning levels of like hopefulness. Where all of a sudden, like, the weight was lifted and I was able to just go, oh, I can breathe for just a little while. Like, I can breathe. Like, th like man, this is gonna, I think it might be okay. And nothing in the situation is revealing that at all. The situation is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. But we're praying and praying and praying and I just keep feeling like I have hope. And I wasn't sure if the doctors had answers. I wasn't sure if the meds would start working. I wasn't sure even if my son was gonna stay alive. I didn't know any of it. But even in the middle of the heartache, I always had this deep feeling that like, it would be okay. And that sounds crazy. But like, I remember praying and like having this revelation of like, even if I lose my son, it will be okay. Like God is really that good. He really did have a plan. And it was like God was telling me the same thing that he was telling Elijah. I've got this. I know in the chaos, it seems like the world is ending and everything is falling down around you, but I've got this. I've got this. And he did. That afternoon, Hudson started to improve like, like out of nowhere. And within like three or four hours, he had gone from the worst that he had been to completely fine and they're looking at discharging him. And they're like, they're like, we thought we were going to keep him for days. Like, we don't, know, we don't know what's happening. They release us, send us home, praise the Lord. Three days later, Chelsea took Hudson back to the same pediatrician who had seen him at first. And 
she takes him, she does his vitals, she does all these exams and all the checks that she needs to do. And she just looks at Chelsea and she just throws up her hands and she goes, I don't have any idea what happened. She goes, I've never seen a kid as sick as he was be completely fine a few days later. She said, he should not be okay. He should not be okay. And Hudson, my four-year-old at the time, uh, looks his pediatrician in the eyes and just says, yeah, but it's Jesus. Says, yeah, but it's Jesus. So here's the thing. I don't know what you're walking through. I don't. I have no idea. I don't know if you're excited for this school year. I don't know if you just started and you're already just dreading every day. I don't know how your family life is. I don't know how, how your friend group is. I, I don't know. I don't know any of that. I don't know what addictions you're struggling with or what, what sins you have or what insecurities. I don't know any of that stuff. But man, we serve a God who knows everything about us. He knows everything about you. And he loves you so much. He has a plan for you that is greater than anything you could ever imagine. And I just want to encourage you guys that as you are in seasons of chaos, that you would be able to find yourself in that place where even in the middle of the madness, you're able to go, yeah, but it's Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to be okay because it's Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to get through this because it's Jesus. Like he, he hasn't brought me this far to just leave me. It's Jesus. Like it's going to be okay. Now here's the thing. That's not going to usually look the way that we want it to look. You know, God had a plan for Elijah. It didn't look the way Elijah wanted it to look. But he promised to take care of Elijah. He promised to take care of Hudson. And he promises to take care of you. He really, really is a good father who loves you and wants to protect you and take care of you and watch out for you. So here's the deal. If you're not a Christian in here, um, sadly, um, you don't necessarily have access to that type of relationship with the Lord. And that might sound real harsh, but that, that, that's what we believe. Like the way that you have access to this level of trust, this level of peace, this level of freedom is by having a relationship with the Lord. And the way that we do that is we believe that Jesus left perfect heaven to come to this earth, lived a perfect life, never made a mistake. Every single one of us makes mistakes. We sin, and that sin separates us from God because he is perfect and he cannot be in a relationship with anyone or anything that is not perfect. So Jesus lived a perfect life so that he could die on the cross and die the perfect death so that he could take our punishment because he did not have to take a punishment of his own. He could take on the punishment for every person who will ever live. And if we just decide to believe that he actually died on that cross to take our punishment and he rose again three days later and we put our faith and our trust in him instead of how good we can be, that we can actually have freedom and peace and joy and fulfillment and all of these things that we long for. The Lord gives us access to that. And so if you have never started a relationship with the Lord, that's, your, that's the first step. And it's simple. You really, you just have to say, God, I just, I want to start a relationship with you. I need you. Save me. And he will come into your life. He will never leave you. And he will transform you from the inside out. If you're a Christian in here, God has a plan for you, man. Being faithful living out your calling, walking in purpose, living on mission, standing up for truth, all of the things that it means to be a Christian is so incredibly hard. In the world that we live in, it can be so hard. But I promise you, God has a plan for you. And he will protect you and he will sustain you and he will walk with you through every bit of it. Trust him. Trust his plan. Trust that he really is good. Let's stop leaning on all of these crutches that we have in our lives that we think will satisfy us, that we think will give us some sense of control in life, and let's be willing to actually surrender and trust the Lord. And I'm preaching to myself too. So here's, here's if you're already a Christian here, I'm going to give you guys a few challenges. 
Okay, and we're going to start doing this more regularly, so, so be ready for this. Okay, but uh, we're going to start giving you guys challenges for today, tomorrow, and this week. Because we want to not just be hearers of the word, we want to be doers of the word. So we want to be able to start walking this stuff out in our lives so that it is ingrained in our hearts and it's not just something we heard and walked away from and totally forgot. So today, before you go to sleep tonight, here's what I want you to do. Write down the biggest thing you are trying to control in your life right now. Just write it down. Just acknowledge it. Here is, this, here is the thing that I'm just trying to hold on to and I, I'm not giving to God. And then I just want you to surrender it to the Lord. Just say, God, this is yours. I'm not going to hold on to this and control it and try to do my thing here. I'm gonna let you have your way. Maybe that's a, a relationship that you've been pursuing or you've wanted or desired and you've gotta just say, God, it's, it's in your hands. Maybe it's a friendship that has fallen apart and you want to control the situation and fix it and solve things and God's just gonna tell you, you just need to let it go. Like, I, I, I will work it out. I don't know what it is for you, but seek the Lord and just ask him what the biggest thing you're trying to control in your life is and write it down, surrender it to the Lord. Okay, that's what I want you to do today. Tomorrow, tomorrow, as soon as you get out of bed, I want you to kneel down beside your bed and just surrender your day to the Lord. Just say, God, this is your day. Be with me, guide me through everything I do. Just start with a simple, like, this is not my life. It's yours. We have a talk with our kids every year before we start school. My kids uh, are in public school, and uh, we, we love it because we've, we think that there's a, a lot of people that need Jesus, and it is a huge mission field. And so we talk with our kids every single year before school starts, and we're like, why are you going to school? It is not to learn, although that's good. It is not to make friends, although that's good. It's, it is to be a light for Jesus. That is why my kids are on this earth. That is why I am on this earth. That is why we do what we do every second of every day. And so get up, surrender your day to him tomorrow. Tonight, write down what you need to surrender, that thing you're grabbing control of. Tomorrow, wake up, hit your knees and surrender that to the Lord. And then this week, this one might be a little bit harder, but if you're up for it, I'm gonna encourage you guys, do a short journal entry just sharing your feelings with God, helping you to process how you're feeling throughout the day or what happened, how you process the day, and being able to just journal that out like you're talking to God about your feelings. As we trust the Lord more and more, we will find more and more freedom and more and more peace, even in the middle of the chaos. As we go throughout our week, let's pursue the Lord above all else and let's really trust him and see when we actually trust the Lord, what happens? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for tonight. God, I pray that you would just work in our lives this week. That God, you would help us to not neglect our times with you, to not um, over-spiritualize or over-emotionalize things that God, we just might need to be a little more disciplined or we just need to talk to somebody or we just need to, uh, any of those things that are practical, Lord, give us those tips. Lord, help us to be honest about our feelings with you. And then Lord, above all, help us to trust you, like really trust you with big things, little things, everything we do. And that God, it would speak volumes to this world uh, in a world that's full of chaos where there are people that can somehow find peace. Lord, I pray that that would be us and that it would be a beacon of hope to the world. Lord, we love you. We believe you for great things this week. Be with everyone here as they go into schools, as they start new routines. God, just shower them with your blessings. Watch over them. Protect them. Protect their families. Go before them in their friendships, in their, uh, with their teachers, with every class, every elective, every, every uh, choice that they have to, to get signed up for something or not signed up for something. God, just guide them in everything you want them to do. Um, and Lord, that everything we do would honor you and bring glory to you. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.